Are you ready? Are you shitty down? We're going to pull back the curtain on the divorce process, the mistakes and the missteps. How can couples navigate the divorce process? Can you still divorce in a healthy way? The conversation is as good as it gets. It's fun, insightful. It will change the way you think about your life and how to tackle life's challenges. The Shine On Podcast, season three. It's episode 55 of the Shine On Podcast. I'm Evan Shine. On today's episode, I sit down with Dr. Joanne Pedro Carroll, best-selling author of Putting Children First, Proven Parenting Strategies for Helping Children Thrive Through Divorce. Dr. Carroll has an absolutely fascinating background and is an advisor and consultant to many organizations, including Netflix, Skydance Studios, and Sesame Street addressing matters related to children, parenting, and resilience. I can't wait to dive into Dr. Carroll's book and talk with her about the impact of divorce on children. We also will discuss the most common mistakes she sees divorcing parents make, the number one piece of advice she would give to parents before parents tell their children about divorce, and so much more, including who her favorite Sesame Street character is. And this conversation on the Shine Up podcast featured guest spot is fantastic. And it's coming up following the new Shine Up podcast segment this year, Ask Evan. And producer Dave, I know you have a special media themed docket for us today that looks at the portrayal and depiction of divorce through the lens of the children really focused on teaching divorce to kids in TV and film. I'm fired up. How about you? I'm fired up as well. Anytime you get to talk to a great guest like Dr. Pedro Carroll and Sesame Street, maybe even some Mr. Rogers, Evan. I'm excited. Let's get into it. All right. And now let's see what's on the docket. All right, Evan. This will become clear to you, the listener, that we have a theme here today. Dr. Pedro Carroll, as Evan mentioned, is a consultant on Sesame Street. And so we'll start with Sesame Street and then consider a couple other clips depicting divorce presented in a way that children should understand, appreciate, and hopefully learn from. So let's start, Evan, with the aforementioned Sesame Street. Item, Item one. one. This is a clip that features one of the characters that Dr. Pedro you'll hear from. Let's take a listen. Hey, what you doing? I'm drawing pictures. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Of what? Of our homes. Yeah, ah. yeah, yeah. We're drawing where we live. This is a picture of Elmo's apartment. This one is where I live with my mommy, and this one is where I live with my daddy. But, Abby, why don't you all live in one house together? Well... Because my parents are divorced. D divorced? Well, divorce means that Abby's mommy and daddy aren't married anymore. Huh. Elmo doesn't get it. Me neither. When my mommy and daddy were married, we all lived together in one house. But then one day they told me they had some grown-up problems. Problems they couldn't fix. Mommy and daddy told me that they decided not to be married to each other anymore. But they said they both still love me very much. I've got big feelings. And then Abby Cadabby goes into her song. So, obviously, a, a very Sesame Street way of explaining divorce. I'm curious as to what your reaction was, Evan. First, I absolutely love, from an educational and divorce perspective, that fantastic shows like Sesame Street address and tackle topics like this. And the presentation of these difficult topics often hard to explain topics, topics that parents so often struggle with, how to get the message across to their children that their parents are separating. Sesame Street, as they always do, they get it exactly right. And look, at this easy to understand and relatable approach through drawings about how the Sesame Street character, Abby Kadabi, lives in a house with her mother and also 
that she lives in a house with her father. It's spot on. But Dave, just like Elmo initially doesn't get it, many children at that age, at a young age, may also not get it. But the questions from Elmo and the other character, Rosita, about what divorce means and follow up to Abby saying her parents are divorced, they're wonderful questions. But the explanation from Abby is spot on. And the line I want to highlight is the unified message from both of Abby Kadabi's parents when she says, they said they both love me. How important is that? Because, Dave, as your children have a lot of feelings. So, Dave, go back to time for you when you think about your emotions, your children's emotions, the feelings that both you had, your children had, when they learned that you were divorcing. What was that like? for you through a parent's perspective and also as you came to learn through the eyes of your children? Well, I don't typically get choked up when watching Sesame Street. I guess I don't typically watch Sesame Street, but but <laughs> but this, this rang true to me because it was one of the first things that my ex-wife and I said to our kids the day we had to break the news to them. It was one of the first things we said was, we both love you very much and we still love each other. And so I remember my younger one, he was very upset, of course. He said, but you still love each other? And we said, yeah, you're going to find out, Griffin, that this is going to work. And it's not going to be easy. And it's going to be a little bit of a change. But for you and your relationship to us, it doesn't change. I don't know if I said it in those terms. but And nothing's going to make it perfect. Nothing's going to make it easy. But... If you start with that message and you stick with that message, you're going to be better off than most, in my opinion. So I definitely think Sesame Street got it right. We'll stay with Sesame Street for item number two. Item two. Sesame Street does a lot of features that some involving the, the Muppets and some not. Here's a different way that they tackled divorce. My name is Chase, I'm 10 years old. I love my mom and my grandmother because my parents are divorced. When my parents got divorced, I was five years old. When you got to camp today? I remember my mom and my dad put moving day on my calendar. On moving day, I saw a big truck in the driveway and we started packing our things. We went to my grandma's house and I lived there ever since. I call my grandma Yaya. Me. Did with crayons. I had to make new friends. I got a whole new room. And I had to go to a whole new school. What was one of the hardest things about moving here to Yaya's house? It was hard at first because I knew I wasn't going to see my dad every day. We have a different kind of family, right? It's yeah. not the same, I think, as it would be if there was a mom and a dad and a kid and just one house. It's not the same thing. It's a different thing. It doesn't have to be sad, right? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be... People don't have to be angry at each other. I think if everybody learns how to get along and support each other and be there for one another, these things don't always have to be sad. It's just the way you kind of look at them. You can come to me anytime you need, right? Mm -hmm. To talk about anything. So we'll stop it there, Evan. But obviously a, a real life account from a young man who I give a lot of credit to because he was very brave to do this segment. Your thoughts on how divorce was presented in in this segment? Yeah, Dave, I echo exactly what you said. He was brave and great thoughts and a great clip from Sesame Street. Three quick takeaways. First, let's highlight the calendar that you see when you watch the clip up on the refrigerator that shows the days Chase is going to spend with each parent, with his grandmother, and really the importance of stability and consistency, which is something that we get into coming up with Dr. Carroll. Takeaway number two, the importance of extended family. Chase talks about his grandmother and living with her, and this support from his grandmother is so important that she helps Chase during this time and during this transition. Number three, Chase says he felt sad when his parents were getting a divorce. And that's a real emotion. That's a real feeling. And the domino effect on what happens for children, he talks about 
new friends he had to make, a new school he had to attend, and what that was like, and a new room. So many things were new. I mean, this was such a new time for him, given the separation, given the divorce, and the transition for the entire family. But Dave, most especially the children, it's not easy. And let's not forget about all that Chase talks about if you're a parent going through a divorce, listening to this episode, new school, new friends, new activities, new room, and that adjustment for children that is inevitable. I agree with you about the structure. I have a child as Evan who has autism and they thrive on structure. And once we explained to him what the new schedule was and stuck to it, he was actually apparently pretty fine with it. And I think that goes for any kid. The more you can have a plan, now, of course, the plans can change, but to have a plan from the beginning saying, listen, most things are going to be the same. Here are a few important things that are going to be different. And then you do the best you can from there. Item three takes us to an iconic figure in television who, sadly, we lost in recent years, uh, Mr. Rogers. Item three. Did you ever know any grown-ups who got married and then later they got a divorce? Well, it is something that people can talk about, and it's something important. I know a little girl and a little boy whose mother and father got a divorce, and those children cried and cried. Why? Well, one reason was that they thought it was all their fault, but of course it wasn't their fault. Things like weddings and having babies and buying houses and cars and getting divorces are all grown-up things. Let's do something different. There are all kinds of ways to make believe. So let's just look closely at these paper cups and think about a picnic that King Friday, Queen Sarah, and Prince Tuesday are having. We're not going to go through the whole make-believe thing that Mr. Rogers does, but you get the flavor of what he was doing. And I do think it was interesting that he sort of right away addressed the question of when kids think it's their fault, which is just one of the more heartbreaking elements of divorce. Your thoughts, Evan? Dave, Mr. Rogers, what a show. And we'll talk more about Mr. Rogers and Daniel Tiger, the incredibly popular children's show that followed a Mr. Rogers legendary, larger-than-life footsteps And does anyone deliver a better and more heartfelt message than Mr. Rogers? But the focus, and Dave, you mentioned it, of this message to children, it's not your fault. The way he uses make-believe and pretend to beautifully describe what happens when parents separate and why parents separate, but most importantly, the love that parents, the love that both parents have for their children. And Dave, the clip goes on for much longer than we played. And parents should absolutely watch the full clip if you're going about thinking about divorce, going through a divorce. But Dave, what are your thoughts on Mr. Rogers' explanation and the way he communicates the topic of divorce to children using make-believe and and pretend? It It's great. It's very Mr. Rogers' style. Kids, I, I think, and, and maybe even in keeping with the theme of structure, kids are used to Mr. Rogers doing the the land of make-believe where the little trolley goes behind the set there and it's it's one of the more sort of magical parts of that show and so I wasn't surprised to see him using that as a way to bring the kids in because we wouldn't want a sort of halting departure from his usual style you have to talk to kids on their level of course and I think he just did it beautifully um he now Evan did you see the documentary about Mr. Rogers that came out a few years back I did. Yeah. And I thought it was great. Yeah, it's terrific. And it really underscores how sort of not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But he really was as genuine as he seems on the show. And thus, a good person to explain to kids about how, you know, things can be difficult. But it's it's all part of life. And some grown-up things, they're going to sort out. And you can, you're can you allowed to continue being a kid. And you're continue to appreciating the land of make-believe. So we're up to the portion of the program, newly installed for season three, where we hear from you, the listener, in Ask Evan. 
Ask Evan. Ask Evan. Ask Evan. Today's edition of Ask Evan, we have a note from Ellen in Rockville Center, New York. She writes, I'm getting divorced, and my husband thinks we should let the kids have a say in what household they spend the majority of their time at. Can he do this? Ellen, thanks for sending the question to the Shine Up podcast. Ask Evan email address, and what a great question that you submit, and it's a question that I'm often asked. First, giving a child a say and a voice in the process is very, very different than letting a child actually decide and make the decision. Second, there's so many considerations that you need to think about. How old is the child? The older the child is, the more weight you may want to give the child's wishes, the more weight you may want to give the child's preferences or considerations But don't forget that you're the parent and you're making the decision at the end of the day. Third, it depends on the process. Are you resolving your divorce in mediation, in collaborative law, in litigation? If you are in litigation and parenting and custody issues are unresolved, a court will likely appoint an attorney for the child whose job it is in New York to give a child a voice and to advocate for the child's wishes. But if you're in mediation or collaborative law, the ways for the child's wishes and voice to be part of the process, there's endless opportunities, whether it's parenting a child specialist or child therapist. But there's a lot of factors that are part of the equation when it comes to what the ultimate parenting schedule will be and how much weight and preference is given to the child's wishes. That's another edition of Ask Evan. If you want to submit a question for Evan to answer on the podcast, email producer Dave at david at pod617.com. Our featured guest on this week's episode of the Shine Out Podcast is Dr. Joanne Pijo Carroll. She is a clinical psychologist, therapist, and an internationally recognized expert on children. She was a professor of psychology at the University of Rochester for 25 years, where she developed award-winning programs used worldwide for children and divorcing parents. Dr. Carroll serves as an advisor and consultant to many organizations, including Netflix, Skydance Studios, and Sesame Street, addressing matters related to children, parenting, and resilience. She's the best-selling author of Putting Children First, Proven Parenting Strategies for Helping Children thrive through divorce. Dr. Carroll, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here. And Dr. Carroll, you've been studying divorce and its effect on children for many years. It's a potentially draining subject and topic to deal with. So what keeps you going working in this field? Listen, what keeps me going are the positive results I see from helping parents do the best they can for their children during what we know is one of the most stressful life changes. The reason I wrote the book, Putting Children First, is I saw from years of research and my work with children and families that those negative outcomes that we hear about all too often are not inevitable. The long-term negative outcomes don't have to happen. There's a lot of variability in how children do over time. And there's so much that parents and professionals that who work with them can do to support children's resilience and healthy adjustment. And for me personally, this work is very rewarding. Um, and we know from brain research that when we have meaningful work, it adds to our own well-being. So I love helping people have health, healthier relationships and happier lives in which they can thrive. So that's what keeps me going. And Dr. Carol, I I would imagine that how a parent approaches the initial conversation with their children, that mom and dad are separating and splitting up is incredibly important. So what piece of advice, what's the first piece of advice that you impart to a parent who is on the verge of telling the kids that their parents are separating? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Evan. That's just one of the most important parts of the process of separating because how it's handled really sets the tone for how children will feel and actually how parents end up feeling 
about how they relate to each other moving forward. I devote an entire chapter in putting children first to this topic because it is so important. And I describe how, you know, parents can go about this and the words that they can use for children of different ages, because it is important to tailor it to children's level of development. And I always encourage parents, when it's possible, to sit down together with their children, kind of bookending them so they can be hugging and, and consoling them, because it's, it is a tough conversation. I advise parents to tell their children about family changes without telling on each other. Children don't want to be burdened by hearing negative things about the other parent. But ideally, parents should sit with their children to explain what divorce means, but also what it doesn't mean. Because with young children, there are many misconceptions. They sometimes worry that if the marital bond could dissolve, if mom and dad stop loving each other, what's the guarantee that they're going to continue to love them? So those fears of abandonment are important for parents to know are there and to understand that sometimes kids have a misconception that the marital problems were because of them. I can't tell you the number of times I've sat with children who said, I'm afraid it was because of me. I could hear my name come up over and over again when they'd argue. So it, it's helpful for parents to know that the children have those worries that they don't often put into words. And they need information about what will change where they'll be, when they're going to see each parent, but also what's not going to change. It's what I call how important it is for parents to express what's not going to change is that forever kind of love that the parents have for their children. I think it's also helpful with older children to, to really emphasize that they don't have to choose between their parents very often with older youth or adolescents, they can align with one parent against the other, especially if there's been an element of blame. And that can really derail kids from the important agenda of being kids, right? And I think one of the most reassuring messages for parents to give children with young children, it can be showing them a color-coded calendar of the days with mom, the days with dad, but also um, with children of all ages. I think it's a powerful message, if it's true, for parents to be able to say, you know, there were good things about our marriage, and we're sad about this too. And one of the best parts of our being together is we got to have you. That's a very powerful message for children to hear. And also for, I also often remind parents that this first time conversation is just the beginning, hopefully, of a process of communicating. It'll be important to check in with each child over time and pay attention to how they're doing and let them know that they will have a lot of feelings that come up. And all those feelings are okay and important to talk about. And Dr. Carol, you talk about that first conversation, the importance of a unified front, the importance of having a message that's clear for the children to understand. Looking at it from the children's perspective, and, and, and you touch on this, when a child thinks that their parents are separating because it's their fault or they're splitting up because of them. What is the most important thing a therapist can get across to the children who just learned that their parents are separating and going through a divorce? Yeah. You know, I think one of the most helpful things is that a therapist can do is really listen and hear children's feelings and acknowledge, even if children often don't have the the words to talk about how they're feeling. One of the things we know is how important it is to help children develop that emotional vocabulary to put their feelings into words. We know from 
research on emotional intelligence. Really helpful to be able to say how we're feeling and, and express it. So there are so many, what I call big feelings that kids have, and there's a whole mix of them that they seldom either can or might be willing to tell their parents about. I, there's so much that they feel deeply, but can't always put into words. They don't want to upset a parent. They may be um, not even real clear about all the mixed feelings. So what, what therapy can be helpful is providing a, a safe space where children can put their feelings into words. And we know from, again, great neuroscience research, and this is true for adults as well, is that process of labeling emotions helps to calm that part of the brain that keeps anxiety and worry going and actually moves the activity from that part of the brain to the frontal cortex, which is the seat of rational thinking, problem solving, better judgment. I'm a, a big fan of um, the legendary Mr. Rogers. And one of the things he's, one of his words of wisdom, some of them were, what is mentionable is manageable. And I've often thought about that when I sit in my own office or play therapy room with children and help them put into words all the different feelings that they're having. And then they can move on to learning some tools, some skills for solving day-to-day -day problems, being able to ask for help when they need it. And Evan, I think part of what a good therapist does is convey a message of hope and healing. I consider hope the travel virtue that gets us through the dark days in our lives, which we all have, and helps us see kind of the cracks in the wall where the light shines through on the other side, knowing that things can be better. And I think another part of what a good therapist can do is work directly with parents and children to open up those doors of communication and reassurance and build family resilience. So there's a lot of good stuff that can happen. And Dr. Carroll, you mentioned one of the all-time great shows, Mr. Rogers. And so I want to ask you about a show that followed Mr. Rogers, which is Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood and other shows like Sesame Street, where you're a consultant. Are shows like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, Sesame Street, shows that followed in Mr. Rogers' footsteps, do they help children to process emotions today? And what's the benefit of the way that these shows are essentially produced and really touch on so many different feelings and emotions that so many children are experiencing? Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because truth be told, there's, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff out there that's not so great. <laughs> that is true. So I love to promote the things that foster emotional intelligence, resilience, healthy relationships, uh, helping kids grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. Don't we all need that in our world? So yes, I think shows like <laughs> all that you mentioned, certainly Daniel Tiger, Sesame Street are, are just a real gift for children. And I want to mention, Ses I've been working with Sesame Street on their resilience project. And I give them such respect for this because it's, it's tricky to tackle the tough issues, which they do with developing special programming around when children have experienced trauma or when a parent's been incarcerated or bullying or the work that um, I've done with them around the whole focus of divorce. And one of the things we developed was, um, and they've really used a lot of the research that I cite in, in my book and putting children first to develop these materials because we know, for example, that children do have big feelings uh, when they hear the word divorce. Sometimes they don't even know what that means. And they often confuse it with, as I've heard, like 
I have a support group program that I started as my doctoral dissertation years ago. It's now in many places worldwide. So I've heard thousands of children worry that their parents' divorce means, as they call it, my divorce. I'm afraid dad will stop loving me. I'm afraid mom will go away. I'm afraid no one will want me. So what the Sesame Street materials do is in this very child-friendly, frankly, a beautifully done way with a character as endearing as Abby Cadabby, she tells the story in a retrospective way of when her parents divorced. And Elmo says in this video, two homes, Elmo doesn't get it. <laughs> and they go on to explain what divorce means. It means when parents aren't married anymore, they had some grown-up problems. But what it doesn't mean is they don't stop loving their child and they're it's a forever kind of love. We also developed a book with the Sesame Street materials called The Two Hug Day. And I love the idea of parents having resources and materials that they can use with interactively with their children. And during challenging times, it could be a real comfort to just sit down and cozy up together. I call these either lap books or cozy time books. And finding a comfy spot to snuggle up and read a book is a great way to remind a child of the, your special bond. And it's a great opportunity that opens up communication. So this 200-day book that we developed talks about what we know to be true for children, that they sometimes have very mixed feelings about going back and forth between, well, think about it, the two people they love most in the world. And so while they may be happy to be seeing the parent they haven't been with, it can be hard to, to leave the parent that they were just with. So this Two Hub Day book does a very nice job of, again, reassuring children about the structure. When are you going to see that other parent again? That's why I like to recommend a calendar in every home with maybe it's color-coded for children who can't read yet, reminding them of who's going to pick them up after, after daycare. All of those things that create a supportive structure. Children feel secure when they know what to expect. And so these materials can really be helpful to them. The Sesame Street materials also have a guide for parents about opening communication, even a section on how to talk with children about blended families when new relationships are introduced, because we know that's another big adjustment for children. Dr. Carroll, what is the most common mistake that you find divorcing parents make? Well, Evan, you know, unfortunately, I think there are many. And I, I, I address this with a lot of empathy and compassion for what parents are going through. As everything we know of research on stressful life changes, divorce is certainly up there as one of the biggest storms. But you know, sometimes unwittingly out of their own pain in the moment and their own vulnerability, they may make quick impulsive decisions in the heat of all those intense emotions and really decisions that, that need more time and good judgment to think through. For example, I think abruptly leaving the family home without preparing children or having a plan in place for when children will be together again with that parent or rushing to a very adversarial stance with each other and taking positions of blame and frankly war in which children can become caught in the middle and that's one of the worst places for children to be is caught in the middle between parent conflict and I should say, it's very clear from years of research, the two most powerful predictors of how children will fare long-term after a divorce or separation. One is the extent to which 
parents can contain their conflict and keep children out of the middle. We know that ongoing protracted conflict, particularly when it involves children and they're caught in the middle, is a huge toxic effect on children. And sadly, for some people, divorce, you know, divorce is supposed to be the intended solution to conflict, right? And an opportunity for new beginnings and more peaceful relationships. It's very, very tough on children when conflict continues over years. So two most powerful predictors, ongoing conflict, or I'm going to put it in a more positive way, the extent to which parents can contain that conflict and protect their children from it. And the second very powerful predictor is the quality of parenting the children receive over time. And we know that all too often there can be a diminished capacity for quality parenting. I think we all know this as parents. When we're under enormous stress, we don't always have the, the energy or the patience to give to what I call those two important pillars of parenting, both love and limits. So you were asking me about mistakes that parents make. So I think a big one is when conflict continues and kids get caught in the middle of that. Another that pulls children into conflict is sharing too much adult information with children or bad mouthing the other parent. I can't tell you the number of times in our groups, kids have so much wisdom. One of the activities I developed in our children's group program is they become a panel of experts and give advice to parents on divorce. And one of the things they say is, please tell us if you're getting a divorce, tell us what's happening, but please spare us the gory details. They don't want to hear about a parent's infidelity or a parent's character flaws because they're part of that parent, part of their DNA. So some other mistakes I think are rushing into new relationships, maybe moving in quickly with another partner before children have even had a chance to adjust to the separation. And sometimes Evan, I, I think parents are so overwhelmed, and this is when I have a special, a special kind of compassion, that they may forget to get the help for themselves that they need. When, and a, another predictor of how well children will do over time is psychological and physical well-being of their parents. So I often encourage parents, both in a parent education program that I developed and in my direct work with parents to take good care of themselves, get the rest, the healthy ways of dealing with stress. All of those things end up helping their children. And it's, it's what we hear when we're traveling, that analogy on a flight. If you encounter turbulence sure. and you're traveling with a young child, take the oxygen mask for yourself first. And it's a very, it's a good analogy because we do. We do. Parenting is the most important job in the whole world. I have, I have a lot of kids. We need to take good care of ourselves if we want to pass on all that good positive energy, which I believe well, most parents so much want to do that. So I encourage parents to Think of those healthy ways to manage their stress, even if it means taking a walk out in nature and taking good care of themselves. Dr. Carol, I, I love that. It's such wonderful and such powerful advice. And you talked about it from the children's perspective in terms of, based on your research, based on the children that you've met and worked with over the years, about how children don't necessarily want all the details of their parents' divorce. You mentioned infidelity. So what advice would you give to a parent who feels the need to tell their child or children about what happened so they don't feel that the child is going to blame them necessarily for their parents' breakup? Yes. You know, Evan, I think that's one of the hardest situations. And 
as I sit with parents who are struggling with that, you know, I think how tough. My heart goes out to the parent who's really been wounded and left and feeling betrayed. But I can also see from the perspective of the other parent wanting to preserve their relationship with their kids, right? And I, I think when we're deeply hurt and we've been betrayed, it's human nature to want justice or what can feel like justice. And a parent may say, I need to tell, I need to tell my kids the truth. I need to tell them all the details. And yet that personal version of the truth may take a toll on that child, particularly young children. And again, in our group program, I have heard children say he or she wanted to tell me about my mom having an affair with her boyfriend, and it just makes it so hard for me to concentrate at school, or I feel sick to my stomach, or makes me never want to see that other parent again. So it's a very, very, very difficult burden, kids of all ages, because again, they're part of that parent. And I do think there could come a time, understandably, when they're, when, when young people are older and they want more details. But so what really happened between you guys? That there's an opportunity there to sort out, you know what? Especially if the parent who had the affair could say, I made a mistake. I never meant to cause that much hurt. There's a place for saying, I'm really sorry for the hurt it caused. And Dr. Carroll, since you've been studying divorce and really the impact of divorce on children, have you seen the stigma surrounding divorce change? And if so, has this change in the public perception of how society views divorce, what impact has that had on kids? Yeah, I think about that a lot, Evan, because when I first started this work, in the 1980s, it was really clear to me, kids felt, they used the words in our groups, makes me feel weird and different. I don't want my friends to know. In fact, one of the great things of having a group program, and this is true for all of us when we're going through tough times, to know we're not alone. Oh, I'm not the only one with these feelings. I'm not the only one whose parents are apart. It is so helpful for for kids to have that sense of camaraderie and support and that they're not weird and different and that they, their family is still okay. They're all, they can all be okay, beyond okay. They can thrive. I think things have changed somewhat about divorce and stigma, but it's interesting to me that kids can still feel it. So one of the things I often advise uh, parents to say when they're talking with their children about the family changes is, we want you to know this isn't a, you have, you don't have to keep a secret about these changes in our family. It's, it's something that feel free to talk with your friends about. And if you want some help, because sometimes kids don't want to tell their friends. Sure. So it can be helpful. I encourage parents to offer help in saying, if you'd like me to tell your best friend's mom about what's happening in our family, and then she can tell him, we can do that. We can help with that. And to be able to point out other families who've come through these changes and are still doing well. I love, I did a follow-up study. It's the last chapter in my book called Success Stories. I absolutely love hearing from, from parents, from families, and I often do. Oh, hey, now we get together for holidays, or we celebrate our kids' birthdays together, or now I can even be with his new wife or her new husband, and we can be at their graduation or weddings and all of those big events, those success stories are very, very powerful. It's part yeah. of what keeps me going. Yeah, no, it's powerful. It's re it's rewarding. 
So, Dr. Carroll, th there's a couple that goes through an acrimonious divorce, and you talk about conflict. Does that couple in a high conflict divorce, are they able to get to that place, to get to that success story, to get to the life celebrations, the weddings, the graduations that you talk about in the last chapter of your book? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, Evan. My answer is it depends, right? It depends on how they handle their conflict. It depends on if they could kind of renegotiate their relationship as former spouses, lovers, to maybe respected colleagues, or at least business partners and the important business of raising their children in a healthy way. If they can do that, and by the way, I don't mean to make this sound easy. It's not easy, and it takes time, but it can certainly happen, absolutely. And I've seen it happen, even with couples I worked with who were in litigation over custody and, and really went through some tough times. But over time, once some of those wounds heal, and they were able to adopt a more business-like relationship. And, and sometimes that mean, might mean parallel parenting, just, not just cooperative parenting. I mean, that's a whole other topic here. I write about in my book that, that sometimes too much communication in the early stages of a breakup is painful. And just reopens wounds. So you may need to have that parallel parenting, which is a more distant but respectful business-like way of relating. And then over time, may become more amicable. And all I know is when that happens, it's such a win-win. No, it's fantastic what, 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 when that happens. And Dr. Carroll, are there books, movies, or TV shows that really can help a child to understand divorce. I know we talked about your fantastic book, which is such a great resource. We talked about Mr. Mr. Rogers and Daniel Tiger. Are there other resources that you recommend for people? If, yeah, you know, that the Sesame Street stuff is online and you can find that at sesamestreet.org slash divorce. And there's a lot there for older kids too. So that's certainly a good one. I'm in the midst of writing a book for children called A Forever Kind of Love. Whenever parents can sit together and snuggle and, and read interactively those, those kinds of materials, I, I think that's so helpful. There are also going to be some, some good movies coming out. Um, Skydance has one that they've been developing, should be out by the end of the year. I think that's going to be a great one called Spellbound. And there are books like Dinosaurs Divorce that can be a good read interactively with kids. There are a lot of good ones, but I would always suggest to parents, read it over carefully first to make sure it's right for your child. And we talked about going through a divorce as parents and then sort of what that next phase and chapter is really going from a married couple to a divorcing couple to co-parents. And so should divorced parents make an active effort to really be together in each other's presence for their children after divorce? Again, uh, my answer to that is going to be, it depends. <laughs> and here's what it depends on. If their being together means there's so much underlying hostility that you can cut the tension with a knife when they're together with their children. And maybe there's even open hostility. You know, that's not going to be helpful. If being together, if by that you mean maybe for a child's birthday, I think if they can do that over time, and have the have it feel respectful with a very positive focus their the preciousness of their child's life that we all celebrate during a birthday. If it can be done in that spirit, then certainly I think children really enjoy that. But if it has the potential of turning into conflict or or animosity, 
it's important to protect children from that. Hopefully, it's something that over time can evolve to the more positive way of being together. Dr. Cowell, we talked a lot about Sesame Street and your incredible work with them. So I have to ask you, who is your favorite character, if you have one, on Sesame Street? <laughs> I waited all the whole show to ask you that question. You're going to make me choose. It's like choosing who's my favorite child. <laughs> However, I have to say, of course, I have a special place in my heart for Abby Adabi because she and I were on set together when she talked about her parents' divorce. And we did it in a retrospective way because talking immediately about those big feelings can be hard for kids. So Abby talked about how it happened a while ago and how she used to feel scared and worried that it was her fault or that she would be not loved anymore. But then she learned it's a grown-up problem, not one that kids cause, not one kids can fix, and that the kind of love parents have for their kids is that forever kind of love. Well, Dr. Carroll, you, you and my daughter, Olivia, share Abby Kadabi as the, your favorite character, so I will definitely tell her. That, that's awesome. <laughs> your book is an absolute must read. I know you mentioned you're working on a new book at this time. Tell everybody where they can find out more information on everything that you're doing and pick up a copy of the book. Sure. On my website, it's easy. www.pedro, P-E-D-R-O hyphen carol, C-A-R-R-O-L-L dot com. Dr. Carol. Thank you again. This was an absolute treat. We appreciate you coming on. I really enjoyed this very much. I love talking about all the positive ways we can have healthy relationships for in, in which families and children can flourish. So thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Episode 55 of the Shine On Podcast. What a show and what a terrific interview with Shine On Podcast featured guest, Dr. Joanne Pedro Carroll, her book, Putting Children First, is a must read for anyone who's going through the divorce process with children, or if you're thinking about divorce. Producer Dave, what a show and great work putting together the media themed docket for today's episode. My pleasure. Very informative today. I love that Sesame Street stuff. You can listen to the podcast on all major podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and wherever else you listen to the podcast, follow the podcast, and subscribe. I'm Evan Shine, and I'll talk to you again real soon.